Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this teaching session that um, jointly organized by the Orthopedic Research UK and the Orthopedic Academy. Our invited guest this evening is Mr. Arman Memarzada, who is a consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, from Cambridge. His special interest is in knee surgery. Um, he is fellowship trained in this uh, specialty and he's been finished his training in 2020. So it's all fresh, but he's done all the fellowships and everything. So it's really wonderful. That's uh, what he's going to bring to us tonight. So um, Arman is going to bring us today his experience from working with the high volume orthoplasty surgeons and from his traveling fellowships, uh, both in the UK and in the United States. He has done his um, fellowship in Philadelphia. So it's wonderful to have that also, that kind of input from um, across the Atlantic. So uh, we're very pleased that Arman has uh, accepted our invitation to jo join us this evening, and I'm sure uh, we'll all learn from him. My name is Firas Arnaut. I'll be moderating this session. I'll be taking your questions. Um, and we'll put them to our man at the end. So please guys, if anyone has any question, don't leave tonight without, with any doubts, okay? Please put on all your questions and we will put them through and we'll, ask, we'll uh, endeavor to answer all your questions. Uh, at the end of the session, there will be an MCQ. So please all pay attention so you can answer the MCQs correctly, but the answers are all anonymous. So no worries, no pressure. Um, if anyone is interested in taking part in a hot uh, seat viva practice at the end, please um, let Hannah or Lydia know that you are interested. So without further ado, I will leave you now with Arman. Over to you, Mr. Memrazada. Thank you for us for that very kind introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we are, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I uh, hope you get some something useful out of the, out of this uh, session. I'm going to be talking about my experience of this, really. So, uh, if you don't agree with some of it, that's fine. This is just my view of it all. I'm going to talk about total knee arthroplasty, biomechanics, and implant design. Um, I am a consultant in um, uh, Cambridge Hospital. Cambridge University Hospitals with a specialist interest in knee surgery. So my talk is going to uh, cover three areas, three main topics really. Uh, history of total knee arthroplasty design, and then I'm going to talk about components, and then we'll talk about mechanical alignment and balancing a total knee replacement. Um, so, so let's talk about the history and also how our understanding of uh, knee kinematics has changed um, over this period. So uh, I'm going to take you back, right back to 1891, to Thermistocles Gluck. What a name. He designed the first uh, hinged total knee arthroplasty using gypsum cement. That's basically plaster of Paris and ivory. And how do you think the results were? Well, they were a disaster. Lots of, uh, lots of soft tissue reaction uh, and lots of loosening. And then nothing very, so th at this stage, the knee was thought to be a simple hinge. That's the biomechanics at this stage. Uh, so then nothing very much happens until Waldius designs this hinged implant um, made, uh, made up of uh, uh, a metallic implant, uncemented, uh, and a simple hinge which only does 0 to 90. It also doesn't have a, a, a trochlear groove. So unsurprisingly, uh, this implant was plagued by uh, migration, impingement, uh, and uh, and stiffness so that also didn't work out very well and you can see that uh, implants are cutting out of the bone there and then we've got 19 in the 1960s professor swanson uh, and freeman uh, challenged this idea of a simple hinge and they decided to do more research uh, into knee biomechanics 
Uh, excuse me for a moment while I just remove the participants. It's just distracting me slightly. Um, so they designed the, the, the knee um, laboratory in Imperial, and they realized that there's more than just a, a simple hinge. There is also sliding involved. So as the knee goes into, into early flexion, it's definitely rolling. Um, the femur's rolling on the tibia. And as it's going in, as the knee goes into further deeper flexion, you can see that the contact points change and that uh, there is also sliding of the femur on top of the tibia. So it's more complex, uh, complex biomechanics here. Uh, so they came up with the idea of, of this four bar linkage model, whereby the, the, the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments control that femoral slide and roll back. And it does seem to work in a, in a very sim simplistic way if you just, just consider the, 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 the lateral or the sagittal plane. So then with this idea, they designed the first condylar metal on, me metal on poly total knee arthroplasty. Now, uh, prior to this, they were all hinges, whereas this, this implant tried to recreate that sort of four bar linkage model. Um, oh, and, and that also didn't have a trochlear groove. And then in the 70s, a trochlear groove was added and a midline gap between the condyles was created. And the reason for that actually was just to be able to remove the cement more easily. And this surprisingly had really good results, 10 year survival and 96%. That's pretty good by today's standards. But this is a very small group. And then in the 80s, there was this massive, in the 70s, uh, there was this massive explosion of, uh, of different total knee arthroplasty designs and some of them went down the route of mechanical alignment and some of them went down the route of anatomic alignment and that's why there are so many different knees on the market. Now what's the difference between them? So let's let's talk about mechanical alignment and anatomical alignment. Um, so we've got uh, the mechanical alignment camp which um, which work to create a, a, a perpendicular axis of the, of the tibia, so that it's completely perpendicular to the mechanical axis of, of the, uh, the mechanical alignment axis. And the idea behind that is that that, that uh, way of implanting the, the tibial tray um, balances the forces on the medial, medial and lateral side and therefore allows it to, uh, to, to stay implanted for longer. Whereas in the anatomical alignment camp, you've got the natural three degrees of varus on, of, the, uh, of, of the tibia. Uh, and therefore the idea was to, to try and recreate that and implant the, uh, the tibial tray at three degrees of varus uh, to try and uh, recreate the anatomical alignment. Now it's important to say this, this alignment method was three degrees for everybody. So it was the same, nine degrees of valgus in distal femur and just three degrees of varus in, in the proximal tibia. Now, if we look at the results of that, there was actually catastrophic uh, wear at five years in the anatomical alignment group. You can see there's lots of, uh, lots of wear on the medial and lateral side of the polys there. And so anatomical alignment was, was, was abandoned in favor of mechanical alignment. And that's, that's, the, that's the way of doing arthroplasty that, that we're all very familiar with. So, um, in the 90s, so, so that was the, the dominant way of doing uh, new replacements for decades. And then in the 90s and 2000s, a few more names into the, into the fray here, Freeman, Pinskarova, and Nakagawa. Uh, they did some more research into natural native knee kinematics. And they discovered actually there are differences between the medial and the lateral side. So the first thing to say is that the, uh, the, the medial meniscus is, excuse me, uh, the medial meniscus is, uh, is pretty fixed, whereas the, the lateral meniscus does, is highly mobile and, and can move, um, especially in deep flexion. Uh, there is uh, the, medial, the medial tibial, um, the, the medial tibial plateau uh, is dished, so it's concave, whereas the lateral tibial plateau is convex, and that again, uh, allows the medial side to be more stable and the lateral side to be more mobile. Not unstable, just mobile. Uh, and then uh, we, we've got, and then more research into this, discovered that the MCL is a tough, thick band, which is isometric, whereas the, the lateral collateral ligament is, is a relatively thin band and is quite lax in, um, uh, in flexion. So these are the differences. And this, 
this is a, um, a transverse or axial view of the tibial plateaus. The left side here, you can see that's the medial side and, and, and the, the right, the, to the right of that is a lateral. And this is mapping the contact points of, um, uh, of the femur on the tibia. And as you can see, as you go into deep flexion, the contact point on the medial side relate, stays relatively um, uh, stable, relatively static, whereas on the right side, the deeper you go into flexion, the more posterior that contact point becomes, which indicates that the medial side stays kind of more or less in the same uh, place, so it's more of a balling socket, uh, whereas the lateral side definitely has this posterior translation, and you can see that on that on that flexion MRI scan, the, the, femur, the, the tibia is so far anterior, the femur is practically falling off the tibia. So um, to summarize that, this has sort of proven that uh, the native knee, at least, is a medial pivot joint where, where the medial um, compartment, the medial plateau and medial femoral condyle, uh, they stay uh, static and they rotate about that axis, whereas the lateral compartment is mobile and is also lax in flexion. So I'm going to take a deep breath there. That's native knee kinematics. So how do we design total knee arthroplasty implants? To do the same thing. Well, it's, it is complicated um, because a new, 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 total knee arthroplasty kinematics relies on so many different things. You've got femoral geometry, you've got polyethylene shape or tibial geometry, uh, you've got the constraint, the amount of constraint, patella obviously plays a role, we haven't even talked about it, uh, alignment of the implants, uh, ligament balancing, everyone talks about balancing, uh, and of course, the dynamic stabilizers. So everything else can be really great, where, but if you don't have quads that work, it's not gonna, it's not gonna function. Also, pretty much all knee arthroplasty implants require the cutting of at least one of the, the cruciates. So it, it is quite difficult to, to, to recreate the native knee kinematics. So let's talk about, I'm just gonna talk about a few of those, those points. I'm not gonna go through all of it, uh, but femoral geometry, first of all. Uh, so, there are different implants on the on the market. Some have variable radius, some have single radius. Uh, single radius implants include the uh, um, Striker Triathlon um, and uh, GMK Sphere by Redactor. And the variable, ra variable radius are uh, Zimmer Persona, Gen 2, um, more of the implants have the have a variable radius. So uh, this if you look at the lateral view of an X uh, of, of a knee, you can see that the, that the, the shape of the femoral condyles is kind of oval, I guess. So it is, uh, you can be forgiven for thinking that a variable radius is required here. Um, but if you were to, to map just the posterior condyles, which is actually the axis about which the tibia, the tibia rotates, you could, uh, if you were so inclined, model this on a circular or a, or a uh, a cylindrical basis. Um, so you can, you decide which of the camps uh, you go into. Now I've got to say the variable radius and a single radius designs haven't shown a different uh, difference in terms of outcomes or in, in terms of survivorship, um, whether that's just down to the radius or whether there are other factors at play, I'll leave you to decide. But I think I would say if you, if you believe that the MCL is an isometric structure, and you use a variable radius, you have to be prepared to accept a certain level of um, MCL laxity in flexion. Whether that's clinically relevant or not is a different point. Okay, then we've got conformity. Now conformity is defined as the, the degree to which the radii of the femur and the, the, the polyethylene uh, conform to each other. So the difference between the radii. Now you can see on the right, this, this is a just to orientate you, this is a sagittal view of, of an implant. Uh, the gray is metal and the white is poly or cream is poly. So uh, the, the implant on the right is a highly conforming implant. And the one on the left is, is, a, is a highly non-conforming implant. It's the opposite. And the one in the middle is, is halfway. Now, in a, in a, in a non-conforming implant, what you get is a, is a smaller area, of smaller contact area. Um, and therefore higher contact stresses. Uh, whereas in a very highly conforming um, uh, design, what you get is a much wider contact area uh, and therefore much lower contact stresses. So that in theory is, is really good in terms of reducing linear wear on your uh, polyethylene because you're not concentrating all the forces as you, as you walk, 
on a tiny area. Now that was a real issue with uh, with older polyethylenes, especially if you if they were stored in oxygen because that oxidized the top layer uh, and and it reduced its structural integrity. Um, conversely, if you're going for a highly conforming um, design, such as the one on the right, what you get is a much higher contact area, which then in turn means that you are creating higher uh, volumetric wear, high, more, more, more volumetric wear, uh, so higher uh, generation of particles. But again, that's uh, in a highly crosslinked polyethylene. That's not such a such an issue. We all know that poly is the, the polyethylene has improved vastly. So uh, that's conformity, and you can also consider this in the coronal plane. So how much conformity you have uh, in 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 the other plane, in the orthogonal plane. Uh, I think most of the time people talk about it in the sagittal plane. Good. Now, the other point to say is you don't have to have symmetry between the medial and lateral compartments of the joint. So this is the, the medacta implant, GMK sphere. And you can see the, the left is, uh, is a medial compartment and it's, that's highly conforming or highly congruent. And on the, on the right, you've got the lateral compartment where you have quite a flat poly and therefore a low conformity. And that allows for uh, more stability in the medial side and more, more mobility on the, on the lateral side. Trying to mimic natural knee kinematics like that. Okay, um, let's talk about the constraint ladder. So uh, the amount of constraint, constraint is, 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 a, is a description of how much um, uh, resistance the, is imparted by the design of the implants. Uh, Sometimes that's considered only in a valgus varus plane, and sometimes that's considered both in some, essentially sometimes PS is included in that, and, and, and sometimes not. It just depends on the, uh, um, the point of view of your examiner, I guess. So I would, I would start with a CR implant, and what you've got there is no posts, so you're relying, uh, so this, this, this doesn't really provide much in, in the way of constraint. The, the next step up from that is PS, so posterior stabilized. Essentially that big post stops your tibia from falling posteriorly uh, against the femoral component. So it's providing some anterior to posterior stability or constraint. And then we can go one step, but, but the PS implant doesn't confer very much in the way of varus valgus constraint. Whereas you've got, a, uh, there are various types of constrained uh, implants or non, uh, non, uh, 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 so where, whereby there is movement and the femoral and the and the tibial components are not linked, non-linked constraint or condylar constraint implants, and essentially the post is just bigger, thicker, uh, and wider, and descent and and uh, and that fits a bit more congruently into the cam uh, uh, or into the box of the um, of the femoral component. And that, so that not only provides anterior to posterior stability, also provides some medial lateral stability. Now you would go with an implant like that if you're concerned about uh, the, the collaterals. However, I would say it's not a, it's, it, this is not a, um, a substitute for the MCL. So if you are concerned uh, about the MCL, you should be really using a hinge. And then we're moving on to the hinges, the rotating hinges. So the, the, it's important to say the higher up you go in a constraint ladder, the more force you are um, uh, transmitting to the implant or cement bone interface. Uh, and that's why you can see that the CR and the PSs don't have a stem. They do have a keel and sometimes there's, there's a stubby stem on the, on the PS implant. But uh, the, if you go for a constrained or higher, you should be using a stem on both of your components. So then we've got hinges. You've got a rotating hinge and a simple hinge. So rotating hinge allows for a bit of rotation as the name suggests. And a simple hinge is, it, is only movement in a single plane. And as you saw from the Waldius designs and the Thermis Togli's Gluck designs, a simple hinge uh, provide, uh, transmits a lot of force to the implant bone interface and therefore is at risk of uh, earlier loosening. So that's the constraint ladder. Good. Uh, this is how I felt when I first started learning about all this stuff. Uh, where, do you do, where do you go? Which implant do you choose? Well, uh, you kind of have to think about, just move back, you kind of have to think about which philosophies you agree with, what's, what's most important for the patient in that specific case, and what you're comfortable using and what you've been trained in. And then you also have to consider 
how your implant does on the MJR, what's approved uh, in your area, in your hospital. So let's say you have now chosen your total knee implant. What have we got to do? Well, we have to make some cuts, and size the implant appropriately and balance the ligaments. There's a little bit more to it than that. You have to expose the knee and then you also have to implant it perfectly so that it lasts for the long term. But we'll focus on these three things in the context of mechanical alignment. So let's plan our cuts. This is a, 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 an illustration of a mechanical alignment versus anatomical alignment uh, in, this right lower, in this right lower limb. And you can see the blue line there indicates mechanical alignment, center of the hip to the center of the ankle. And the red line there is the mechanical, is the anatomical axis of the femur or also the tibia. Um, now it's important just to reiterate that, the, that um, in the majority of patients, the tibia is in three degrees of uh, natural varus, okay? That's the majority. Obviously there's a standard di uh, distribution. Um, if, you, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, look at, uh, look at the Bellman's paper, seminal paper on, uh, uh, on uh, alignment in total knee arthroplasty. But essentially three degrees of varus is what you've got in the tibia on average in the population. So I'm just gonna zoom in on the tibia there, uh, on the knee there and, uh, and do what we all do, of course, um, preoperative templating. So the black line there indicates joint line obliquity. Um, the blue line there is the mechanical alignment uh, line, the mechanical axis. And what I've done there is, is drawn a line 90 degrees or perpendicular to that blue line because the mechanical alignment, what we want is tibial, tibial implant to be perpendicular to the mechanical alignment to balance the forces on it. Here we are, that's how we're gonna make our tibial cut. Now, in order to be able to, to, to create a, a rectangular space for our femur and the tibia, what we have to do is cut the femur in extension 90 degrees or parallel to this line, essentially, or so 90 degrees to the mechanical axis. So that's where we're gonna make our cut. And that gives us a nice rectangular box for our implants. Now that just happens to be in six degrees of val val valgus in the majority of patients. It, on average, should I say. Actually, it's not the majority of patients, but on, on average is six degrees uh, valgus. Um, good, and that's where the six degrees of valgus comes from. So now we have a nice rectangular space in extension, and what we have to do is match that in flexion so that we've matched our flexion extension gap, so the patient isn't too tight in flexion or isn't too loose in flexion. So I've, I've gone and drawn those lines for you. This is the knee... Um, in flexion, you can see the femur end on. The blue vertical blue line is the mechanical axis. You can see it goes through the center of the femur. And the blue line there is the cut that we've already decided to make on the tibia, perpendicular to the mechanical axis. So now what we have to do is cut our tibia in flexion or the, the posterior cut of our femur, um, perpendicular to the tibial cut. Uh, so there. That gives us a nice rectangular box, both in flexion and extension, and they should then they should match. Now you'll notice that the that the black line there is the that the thick black line is the natural obliquity of the joint. And we said that, that the tibia was in three degrees of varus. This this makes it three degrees of external rotation to the posterior condylar axis. Oh, okay, so that makes sense. So that's, so when we, when we are sizing the femur, once we've taken, once we've done our distal cut, and we're sizing it, always reaching for that three degrees of external rotation. This is the reason we choose three degrees of external rotation because on average, the knee is in three degrees of obliquity. And if we've cut the tibia in, in perpendicular to the mechanical axis, the, the posterior femoral cut needs to be three degrees external rotated. Otherwise you get uh, an oblique flexion gap. So you have some, some laxity in, flex in uh, med uh, on the medial or lateral side. Does that make sense? Uh, now, I'll just go back to that because a lot of people think that the three degrees is so that you, you bring it closer to the, to the patella. There is, that does happen, but that's not the primary reason. That's a subsequent occurrence the reason you do three degrees of external rotation is because you want to match the flexion and extension and you've cut the tibia in, in, in perpendicular, uh, perpendicular to the mechanical axis. Now, I hope that makes sense. We can go back, we can come back to that later. Now, 
I'm going to go through posterior referencing and anterior referencing, but I'm just going to have a little drink. Now, I'm sure you've heard about posterior referencing and anterior referencing. Essentially, we're on to the second part of our, of, our, uh, um, of our treatment algorithm. We need to size the femur. So we want to get the right size implant for that patient. So essentially, we need to measure how, what the length of this uh, femur is from anterior to posterior. Now, where you decide to measure from is, is what posterior anterior referencing means. So this is a posterior referencing jig. So what you're doing is measuring from the posterior condyle upwards. Now, uh, in the majority of cases, you get it absolutely right and it's perfect and you don't have to worry about it. If, if say, you were to uh, have an off day and undersize the femur, because you have referenced it from the posterior femoral condyle, what you get is a smaller implant than, than, what, than the native femur, but you're taking that extra bit of bone cut in the anterior part. So therefore that leads to notching and we're all worried about notching because there's a, there's a fracture risk of the femur. On the other hand, if you were to oversize it, if you were to, to go one bigger because you're worried about notching, what you get is, is, uh, is the right place posteriorly again because that's where you've measured it from. But you do end up with a bigger chunk of metal in the anterior aspect and that's called overstuffing the joint. So you would use posterior referencing if what you want is a consistently well-matched posterior uh, cut and therefore flexion gap, but that is at the expense of potentially either notching the femur or overstuffing the, the patellofemoral joint. Or you can just get it right and not have to worry about it. Now, uh, in contrast, you've got anterior referencing where this is just reversed. So what you're doing is measuring from the anterior femoral co cortex. And so when you get it right, it's perfect. When it's small, if you, if you were to undersize the femur, you would never notch because you've actually referenced it from the anterior femoral cortex. But what you get is a smaller recreation of that posterior femoral condyle. Therefore, you get, re you get reduced posterior condylar offset, which is a concept you can look into later. Uh, and therefore, you get looseness in flexion. If you were to oversize it, overstuff, you overstuff the flexion gap and therefore, uh, it's difficult for the patient to flex their knee because you have created a bigger femur than, than was originally there. So with anterior referencing, you never notch the femur. So you prevent femoral notching, but that's at the expense of the, um, the, the flexion gap. Now it's up to you to decide which of those methods you want to employ, but you just need to know what they, what they mean. This, is, this was probably more of an issue when uh, John Insull originally came up with, uh, with originally started popularizing the mechanical alignment philosophy because implants weren't, there weren't so many sizes of implants available. So you had to kind of go within five millimeters. Uh, the next size up would have been five millimeters bigger. It's, it's less of an issue now, but the principle is something you need to be aware of. Um, okay, so then we get on to balancing, sagittal balancing. Um, essentially, this means balancing the flexion and extension gap. Now, there are certain things that will affect the flexion gap and extension gap. The tibial cut affects both the flexion and the extension gap, whereas all the other things affect only the flexion or the extension gap. So uh, the posterior femoral cut we've already talked about affects the flexion gap. The tibial slope affects the flexion gap and the PCL affects the flexion gap. Uh, the, the extension gap is the distal femoral cut or the posterior capsule. So I'm going to go through some scenarios. Let's say uh, you have done your femoral and tibial cuts and uh, you can't get the smallest polyethylene uh, liner in, in flexion or extension, but actually the gap that you have is fairly symmetrical. So that's an easy problem to answer. What you do is you take a little bit more of the tibia and that allows you to put, uh, because the tibia, a tibial cut affects both the flexion accent and extension, you've created a bit more space and it's automatically symmetrical which is where it was before. So that's an easy fix. Um, let's say conversely, you've done your cuts and you've got uh, a good flexion gap, but your extension gap is too tight. Now, what can you do in that situation? The first thing you can do is you can release the posterior capsule because, because we've said that that, that that can affect the extension gap. Um, and if that doesn't work, what you'd have to do is cut a bit more off the distal femur. We know that the distal femur affects the, the, the extension gap. Um, 
if you were to do that, you'd have to recut the, uh, the chamfers as well. Just be aware of that. Um, so again, fairly easy problem to fix. Let's say the opposite is true in that you've got asymmetrical gaps and your extension gap is, uh, is, is good, but you're, you're tight in flexion. Now, this is interesting because it can either be that you're tight in flexion or that you're loose in extension. So both that, that problem can fall into both of these. Um, it's a slightly diff more difficult problem to fix. Uh, you can either cut a bit more off the, off the tibia. You have to be aware of how much you cut it at before. Or you can, you can downsize the femur and translate it uh, anteriorly. So that depends on whether you've referenced it, you've, done, you've gone for anterior referencing or posterior referencing. If you've gone for anterior referencing, you could just downsize the femur. If you've gone for posterior referencing, as you remember, downsizing it doesn't affect the flexion gap. So you would have to translate it as well. So a bit, little bit more thinking involved here. Uh, there we are. So you can downsize it. It gives you a bit more flexion gap. Or you can distalize the femur. Now, uh, if you are going to use an augment, you're going to have to uh, use a stem and use a revision a revision kit. So uh, not very uh, not very easy to do um, unless you have the kit available. So slightly more difficult problem to, 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 to fix. But these are all scenarios that you should be familiar with and uh, should be at the tips of your tongues when, uh, when you're sitting the exam. So just to summarize that, uh, if the problem is symmetrical tightness, then you cut proximal tibia. If the problem is tight and extension, you can release the posterior capsule or cut a bit more of the distal femur. And if you're tight in flexion, then you can either cut more slope on the tibia, you can recess the PCL, uh, use a distal femoral augment, or you can downsize the femur and shift. But it just requires a little bit more thinking. So I think that's the end of, uh, that's the end of those three things. Uh, I think we said, talked about the knee, knee biomechanics. That it's an, I believe it's a medial pivot joint. Uh, we've talked a, little, a lot about total knee arthroplasty designs and also talked, to, talked a lot about mechanical alignment, different cuts, balancing and referencing that are involved. I hope you found that useful. That's the end of that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marzada, for this uh, comprehensive and focused uh, lecture. We certainly came from it. Um, you took us through everything about knee replacement, history, biomechanics, constraint ladder, balancing techniques, and all of that. It's really very, very interesting and, and, um, and very educational. Um, thank you for all the time and effort you put into uh, producing this. If you don't mind, uh, can I put through to you some of the um, audience uh, questions? Yes. Okay. As you can imagine, as much as it is straightforward, a lot of the terminology, some people get confused with the terminology obviously used in knee replacement. It, it is a complex joint. Um, so we have a question from Mitwali. He's asking, what's the difference between gap balancing and major dissection? You obviously touched on that, but you use different terminologies there, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So, um... so it's exactly what Arman have said before, uh, but he will explain to us more. So uh, when you're when you're doing okay, so in reality we use a, we use both of those methods in, in in most people use both of those methods in in doing a knee replacement. Uh, measured resection is where you um, try to figure out how much your implant is the thickness of your implant, and then you measure how much you take off the off the bone, whether it's the distal femur or the proximal tibia, uh, and you cut at that level because what you're doing is you're replacing the bone that you take off with the metal. Now, what you have to consider there is cartilage loss and what you have to consider is bone loss. So when you're, when you're for example, when you're doing uh, uh, your distal femoral cut, you put your intramedullary alignment in, uh, the jig usually has nine millimeters or 10 millimeters depending on your, uh, on your uh, system that you use. And that's essentially measured resection. You just have to figure out whereabouts that's that's referencing from um, and so you may have seen that people take off any large osteophytes if they're interfering with that because essentially you're you're going to be overstuffing it if you're measuring from an area that's that, that you're not supposed to be measuring from uh, similarly with your proximal tibial cut if you use an external uh, external alignment uh, jig you will use a, uh, uh, a stylus and reference from uh, either the medial or lateral side and unworn side 
outside an area that you, you think would have been where the, the tibia was uh, and you cut it at that level thinking that what, you, what you've taken off is nine millimeters, 10 millimeters or whatever it is your, the thickness of your implant is from the proximal tibia and where it was. So you're replacing that. Uh, gap balancing is a different thing and it, it's slightly different uh, in that uh, it, it's more of an American thing. It, you, you kind of you cut the, you make your cuts uh, on one of the bones. And then what you do is you jack it out and you try to, uh, you try to um, the, the soft tissue envelope to a level that you think is normal. So not too tight, not too, not too um, uh, lax. And that is your reference point, point for, for cutting your, uh, your other side, which is the femur or the tibia. Um, there are various aids to help you with that. You can use kind of uh, pressure monitors and that sort of stuff. Um, but essentially, I think what we do is a, is a blend of the two. We definitely use measured resection. And then through, through this, what you also do is you do, uh, you, you do balance the ligaments at the same time. So if a side is too tight, you either decide to release, for example, let's say the medial side is too tight in a varus knee, you either decide to release um, uh, release the uh, the MCL and go right, right around to the posteromedial side, or you cut the tibians in, in a degree of varus or so. Um, I I hope that answers it. So essentially, measured resection, you measure you measure how much you take off and you replace it with metal. Uh, gap balancing, you try and get the soft tissues right and then make your cuts. Um, I think we we use a, a blend of the two personally. Thank you very much. So would you think that's um the gap balancing technique goes in line with the kinematic kind of alignment because you're cutting where you think the soft tissue balance dictates. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think so, um, especially when it comes to, so I, I, I believe MCL is isometric. So I think if you're gonna balance anything, you've gotta make sure that what you're doing is, is right for the MCL. So if you're gonna balance it, you've gotta make sure that the, the big osteophytes on the medial side have gone. Um, to, to be able to reference it because uh, you guys will understand if, if there's a big osteophyte on the medial side, the MCL is being tented. Uh, let's say you, it makes you over or overcut and therefore you, you lose quite a lot of, uh, uh, once you've made your cuts, then the MCL becomes quite lax. So you have to bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Now we have one more question uh, from Martinique. He's asking what is, you said in your lecture that you would use a stem if using a con constraint uh, knee replacement yep. and they are, want to know why why we're using stem very good question so essentially uh you may remember what i said was uh all implants transmit forces at the cement or implant bone interface and uh, the more constraint you have the less is the the less the more constraint you have the more of that force goes through the the implant bone interface and if you have a small surface area uh in the case of a cementless implant then that that's a quite a lot of force uh, concentrated on a small area it's going to loosen really quickly so to try and reduce that what you use is a stem which then increases the contact area of the implant bone or cement bone uh, area and therefore that dissipates the forces a bit more uh, hoping that, that the implant lasts for longer and loosens less less quickly. Excellent that was very clear thank you very much. Now we're talking about uh, referencing, anterior referencing, and, and that's you always used to confuse me. I, I me spent too. years getting confused and I, no one could tell me the clear answer. You, you've done it very well today, uh, but you know, it's used to always confuse me. I think people don't know what, what is posterior reference, as simple as it is again, but yeah. people think this, uh, the style is always in the front. So they think it's a anterior referencing all the time. Yeah. But, but it, the stylus will have to be in the front, but it doesn't mean that it's anterior referencing. It can be, it can be not. It That's depends true. on the device and on the actual design of the device on what exactly when you put your, but if you can just um, explain that to us again, uh, just go through this posterior referencing, anterior referencing for us again, yeah. so that people will know exactly what is this anterior and posterior referencing. It's not where you put the stylus, guys, okay? It's stylus, you know, it's just you measuring the size, but it, referencing depends on the implant you use. And some implants have anterior referencing and posterior referencing. So that's a very good point. And you do need to get to know your system. This is, I'm just gonna show you this slide. You've got, um, 
a jig with both anterior and posterior referencing holes there. I uh, no no sorry, I've got the wrong one. So uh, you've got a jig here on the left side is anterior referencing, and can you see this tiny little anterior referencing uh, uh, laser marking? And on the right side, you've got posterior referencing. So there, it's quite subtle. If you don't know that this is a difference, you could easily get it wrong. So you just need to know your system. This is clearly not one that I use, otherwise I wouldn't, I would have known it from the beginning. But essentially, uh, it determines where the two, where the, where the two points are um, on your cutting jig, on your cutting block, um, so that that moves up or down depending on the size. And if I were to show you this one, uh, this this is a jig with both anterior and posterior uh, referencing pins. So you can you can this with this jig, you can certainly get it wrong. Um, you've got anterior and posterior, and it doesn't even have a written on there, does it? No. So you, you just have to know your system in this one. Uh, this is the Attune kit. Um, you just need to know where you are going with it, because if you go for the wrong hole, you could you could really notch or overstuff or yeah, cause some cause some serious uh, issues. So um, if I were to go back to making that point what you've got from posterior referencing you're referencing from the posterior femoral condyle upwards so if you were to get it if you were to undersize it you would notch but the idea is that you always get consistent uh, flexion gap so that's really good if you want to not have mid flexion instability if you always want your knee to be well balanced you just have to be aware that you can notch the femur. Now, personally, this is the system I like to use because I can manage the, the notching bit myself. I try and go as small as possible. And if it looks like I'm notching, I just take the jig off and try and try and blend the top. Um, what I don't want to do is overstuff the, 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 the patellofemoral joint. But I, I really want to make sure that consistently I've got the flexion gap right. Whereas if you are concerned about, if you're using anterior referencing, you'll never notch the femur, but it's much harder to to blend the posterior femoral cut if you get it too small or too big. So that's what I would say. But get to know your system. Brilliant. I wish I listened to this lecture a few years ago. It saved me a lot of uh, embarrassment. So we have one more question now, a bit more compli complex question. So Sinan asking, how would you use the posterior anterior referencing system if you had posterior medial condylar loss? from previous fractures, for example? Yeah, um, good point. So <laughs> there are various ways around it. Essentially what you're doing is you've got a plan in your mind and what you have to do is get that right in, in the femur. You plan your cuts and that's where you want to make the cuts. Now, you can either um, be really good at judging where those lines are. So you can try and imagine where the old femur used to be and that's probably uh, plan A, so you're trying to figure out where what you're referencing off. Now, the posterior femoral, uh, posterior condylar line isn't the only line you have available as referencing. What you've got is the transepicondylar axis, you've got white sides line. Uh, you can use either any of those references really. If you think that there's too much too much bone loss for those that sort of referencing, you can use um, uh, you can use patient specific instrumentation. You can use uh, robots. You can use navigation. So there are various ways of getting uh, referencing it. What you have to decide is whether you can do that yourself or do you need some extra help. Now I would say that in the majority of cases, if there is a bit of tele if there is a bit of posterior condylar loss, and that happens to be usually in the or well, people talk about a uh, hyperplastic lateral femoral condyle, that's probably the most common common thing you see. And 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 people try and um, uh, surgeons try to uh, align their implants with the transepicondylar axis, which isn't affected by the posterior condylar wear. Uh, or perpendicular to white size line, which is the deepest part of the trochlear groove. Uh, now, if you feel that you can you can use those use those, res those references, then great. And I think in most cases, most cases you can. If there is quite a lot of quite a lot of wear, then and you need to use PSI or robots or navigation, then I then you may also need to use an augment. So you probably need to need to go up in terms of your constraint. I hope that's helpful. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we have one more question from Hamid. He's asking about the kinematic concept uh, in TKR. You touched on that, um, but uh, they, I think they just wanted to know. Um, yeah, so I, 
So I was dangling that little that little worm and they bought it. Perfect. Uh, so uh, kinematic alignment, very interesting. Lots of uh, lots of research being uh, going into this at the moment. Quite a divisive divisive subject because um, if you look at kinematic and mechanical alignment, there isn't a lot to choose between them. And and kinematic alignment is is a bit early in terms of its its development. It doesn't have the decades of uh, of outcomes that mechanical alignment has. Essentially, what you're doing is um, matching the alignment of your implants to that patient's anatomy. Now, if you look at the Bellman's curve, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a standard distribution. Uh, there's a normal distribution of, uh, of, of uh, alignments in the population, uh, you, with the average being around three degrees uh, of varus, but, but that only really matches about 15% of the population the rest of the population, they, they sit either uh, more varus or more valgus. So if you go for that three degrees of varus, i.e. mechanical alignment, you, you, will, you, will, you will get that absolutely right. You, what you're doing is doing kinematic alignment for 15% of your, of your patients and the rest of them uh, less so. And you have to do various releases to cut to, um, to, uh, to balance the knee. Uh, what I'm not answering very well here is, is essentially kinematic, in kinematic alignment, you, you, you make your cuts according to the soft tissue tension, so you don't have to release any ligaments. Um, it's quite complicated, and I would suggest reading a little bit more. There are some really good review articles about kinematic alignment. Um, uh, Prof Pandit from Leeds has written a good review article. Uh, Charles Riviere uh, has written some good articles about it. Um, and uh, look at look at look at Bellman, the Bellman's paper, and um, I can't remember the name of the the, the Californian guy. Um, but yeah, there are, there's lots of lots of good articles on there. But I'll start with the review article first. Thank you very much. I mean, it's a it's a quite a complex concept. It's not that straightforward. Yeah. And a lot of it, a lot of us would use combination as well, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Got, there's no point doing perfect cuts and then the balance is all off. You got to check your balance and, and vice versa. If you do balance techniques and your bone has to be, um, bone cuts have to be well measured as well. Yeah. So it's a combination. Most most knee arthroplasty surgeon will use a combination in real life. Yeah. But there are implants who are particularly designed to be kinematic alignment implants, isn't it? You touch on the medacta and all of these. So, right. so there are implants specially made for kinematic alignment. Um, yeah, that's that's right. great. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So um, I think we can now uh, move on to the MCQs. Okay. Um, uh, please, um, Anna and Lydia, if you can start sharing the MCQs. So, okay, guys, these are uh, three MCQs we have related to the lecture. Uh, uh, Mr. Mamarzad have prepared for us. He will go through the answers and uh, discuss this with you shortly. So please, everyone, we have 84 participants tonight. So please, everyone answers. These answers completely anonymized. Um, so you can um, safely uh, give it a go. Uh, but please, uh, Olga, we'll give you a couple of questions. Uh, sorry, a couple of minutes to answer. If any one wants to take part in a Viva hot seat practice after this, uh, please let uh, Hannah know, please. Yeah, you'll find Hannah, she's the host. Let her know. And any further questions about the lecture, please write it in the chat. Well then guys, we got, um, yeah, we need more people to answer, only 10%. We need 100%. Everyone give it a go. Um, you won't lose anything, you will learn. Whether you got, if you got it right, you'll learn that, uh, you know that you have learned something. If you got it wrong, it will, you will remember it next time. So please give it a go, everyone. <laughs> 
the replacement. The more you think about it, the more tricky it gets, isn't it? The more difficult it. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I must say, uh, doing those MCQs, I, uh, I had to do a lot of thinking to make sure the yeah. word was right. Right, Hannah, let me know in um, how many minutes we've been now. Three, okay, I've got the timer, three minutes. So I think that's um, that's enough, guys. I think uh, that's what you get in your exams. I think you get just over one minute per question in the real exam. So I think um, that's it. So we'll end the poll here. Thank you, everyone, uh, guys, who tried to answer. Um, Stelma Marzada will uh, take us through the questions and the answers now, please. Okay, uh, so... Question number one, native knee kinematics most, close, most closely resembles medial pivot model. Uh, we talked about this, we've got uh, the medial compartment is state, fairly static and rotates, uh, whereas the, uh, the lateral compartment is highly mobile because of those differences that you saw, the, the, uh, the, the convex lateral tibia plateau uh, and the contact point moving posteriorly, so it's a medial pivot. Question number two, very confusing. Which of the two, which of the following statements about total knee implants is false? So uh, reducing conformity increases contact stresses on the polyethylene bearing. It does, doesn't it? Because um, it, it makes the contact area smaller, which concentrates the stresses. Uh, reducing conformity increases the amount of volumetric wear on polyethylene bearing. Well, uh, it doesn't because uh, it, it increases the amount of linear wear because you've got a smaller contact area, you have less volumetric wear, but more kind of boring, more of that linear wear. So that's false, which is why that's the right answer. Reducing conformity increases mobility of range of movement. Yes, so if you have a smaller, if you have less conforming implants, it allows for more mobility. And reducing conformity increases the amount of linear wear. We already said we already discussed that on the other bit. So the final final question: Which of the following statements regarding flexion extension gap balancing is true? Uh, well done to most of you. The cutting tibia will affect both flexion and extension. Um, for, so distal resection of the femur will increase the, the extension gap. Uh, when using the posterior referencing method, method downsizing the femoral component doesn't do anything to the flexion gap. Um, when using the anterior referencing method, downsizing the femur will, will reduce the, uh, uh, um, it will increase the flexion gap because you're making it smaller. So I hope that was useful. Well done to those who got it right. And uh, it's all a learning opportunity. That was brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Marzada. That's, that was great. Um, Again, on behalf of uh, ORUK and Orthopedic Academy, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, and as I said before, we rely on uh, generous, general, um, generous educational consultants like yourself who, to join us and, and keep this program going. And without you, we cannot continue. So thank you very much again for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Good luck to all of you. Goodbye. Thank you very much.